And beneath your knowing and doing is, of course, something called being. Now, being, your being, doesn't even take your mind. Being your being is in a way like doing nothing. Uh, it's, it's your consciousness being your consciousness. It's your consciousness surrendering to being the consciousness that you are. And so this kind of experience of infinite silence, as we sometimes call it in meditation, is an experience of your consciousness being itself uh, in the context of being the whole part of the wholeness of being uh, that your consciousness is being. Well, there's something very similar about you and me as, as human beings. Of course, your specific history and, and specific biology and genetics and so forth is all unique. Uh, but I'm using the category being as something we have in common. Uh, and it's our consciousness is our being in the arena of being conscious of the consciousness itself and of all of its struggling. So wherever your consciousness is struggling, that's your being. And to be conscious of that being, it's not just ideas in your head that you're conscious of, although those were possibly reflecting your, your being, but your being is a deeper experience. Your consciousness, being conscious of your consciousness, and the mind can begin working with it, but it's not the mind you're, you are when you're conscious of your consciousness. As you become more conscious and more conscious of your consciousness, and, and your consciousness changes at every minute of your life, and you become more mature at living from your consciousness and all that kind of thing. Uh, but your consciousness is very similar to my consciousness, and it's something created by your creator. It's not something you invented. Uh, being a conscious being is one of the miracles of your existence uh, to which you had nothing whatsoever to do. And you're a member of a species that is conscious in the way that you can be conscious. Uh, it's very different from other species. Joe Matthews, some of you know, some of you don't, but my main mentor in life and the founder of the religious order that some of us here belong to at one time, he talked about great thanks, I'll just call it GT, that means great think, great feel, and great resolve. You can see the knowing, being, doing structure here. <laughs> uh, great thinks is something that your mind participates in. Great feel is something your, I don't know what, your deep being participates in. And the great resolve is your intentionality. You're taking that in and living it. Pole of the all experience. So all is great think, or can be accessed through great things that go with it, great feels, and great resolves. Um, now we built, or Matthews built, or some of us helping Matthews build, a whole bunch of charts uh, on states of being with different great things and great feels and great resolves. Uh, just an amazing contemplative inquiry into the whole wonder of, of, of all. But let me illustrate the great think image. And I want you to try to come up with what is the great feel that goes with these great things? And what is the great resolve that goes with these great things? Life and death are two wings on the same bird. Death walks with us every day of our living. As Carlos Castaneda suggests, death walks behind us, just over our left shoulder. If we turn our head quickly, we might see death walking there. Anyhow, you get a certain sense of what we're talking about here with these three categories, uh, that any particular great thing that leads you into a state of awe has with it some feeling, some deep feeling, and has with it the necessity to resolve in order even to experience this, uh, this happening. Well, I'm gonna take us a little further into this and read a poem when the Matthews and company created these charts of, of um, 
of the, all the states of being of all there are, <laughs> in principle. Of course, any chart is incomplete, but, uh, but anyway, that was the idea. What are all the states of all? And we came up with that in one sentence, if you believe it. We live in a land of mystery that contains a flowing river of consciousness, a huge mountain of care, and a wild sea of tranquility. Those four categories uh, can be used, we said, to symbolize, or at least to organize, all the many states of all that human beings are experiencing. We live in a land of mystery. We know nothing about it. We don't know where we've come from. We don't know where we're going. We don't know where we are. We are newborn babes. We have never been here before. We will never see it again. This moment is fresh, unexpected, surprising. As this moment moves into the past, it cannot be fully remembered. All memory is a creation of our minds, and our minds cannot fathom the land of mystery, much less remember it. We experience mystery now, and only now. Any previous now is gone forever. Any yet to be now is not yet born. We live now, only now, in a land of mystery. It is true that when you think, you think you have to know everything, that's kind of upsetting because you know you don't and know you never will. And so to really give up and live in a land of mystery might be calming. Yeah. Let's look at the river of consciousness. I'll read this one and we'll try our, our sensibilities of feeling and resolving on it. Within the land of mystery, flows a river of consciousness or freedom. Consciousness is a moisture in the desert of things, an enigma in the land of mystery. Consciousness flows through body and mind. Our bodies are pain and pleasure, desire, emotion, stillness and passion. All these are but rocks in the water on the banks of the river of consciousness. Consciousness is not the body but a flow through the body and with the body. Consciousness is an alertness that is also a freedom to intend, to will, to do. The mind is a tool of consciousness, providing consciousness with the ability to reflect upon consciousness itself. But consciousness cannot be contained within the images and symbols of the mind. Consciousness is an enigma that mind cannot comprehend even noticing consciousness is an act of consciousness using the mind and flowing like a river in the land of mystery. That's what awe is like. It is thoughts that the mind uses to kind of get a hold of it, and then it is a genuine deep feeling, and it is a decision. Within the land of mystery rises a mountain of care. Care for self, care for others, care for earth, care for the cosmos, care that we exist, care that we suffer, care that we may find rest and fulfillment, care that we may experience our caring and not grow numb and dead. It takes no effort to care. It takes effort not to care. Care is given with the land of mystery. Care is part of the mystery of being. We care. We just care. We are made of care. Care is a mountain because care is so huge, so challenging to embrace, to climb, to live. Care is a demand upon us that is more humbling, more consuming, more humiliating than all the authorities and laws and obligations of our social existence. Care is a forced march into the dangers and the hard work of constructing a life that is not a passive vegetable growth, nor a wildly aggressive obsession. Care is an inescapable given simply there, yet care is also an assertion of our very being. It is compassion, devotion, 
love for all that is given and for all parts of every given thing and being. Like Atlas, we lift the planet day by day, year by year, love without end in the land of mystery. The Sea of Tranquility. In the land of mystery, there is a sea of tranquility, a place of rest amidst the wild waters of life. The waves may be high, our small boat tossed about, but there we are with a courageous heart. It is our heart that is courageous. We are born with this heart. We do not achieve it. We can simply rest within our own living heart our own courageous heart that opens vulnerably to every person and all the aspects of that person, to our own self and to every aspect of that self, to life as a whole with all its terrors and joys, this is a strange rest, for no storm can end it, no challenge of life defeat it, no loss, no death, no horror of being, no fear can touch our courageous heart. We live, if we allow ourselves to truly live, on this wild sea of everything, in the tranquility of our own indestructible, courageous heart. To manifest and fully experience this tranquility, we only have to give up the creations of our mind that we have substituted for this ever-present peace. We have only to open to the land of mystery flowing in a river of consciousness, containing a mountain of care. Here and here alone do we find the sea of tranquility. Here in the land of mystery that our mind cannot comprehend, create, or control, here beyond our deepest depth or control is a sea of tranquility in the land of mystery. So that's what we're going to try to do in this session, is talk a little bit about wonder, dread, but also fascination. I mean, you, you're driving down the road and you experience an auto accident. It's, that's a dreadful experience. Maybe somebody's dying, maybe somebody's badly injured, ambulances are coming, police are coming, so forth. But it's also fascinating. You may not be able to take your eyes <laughs> off of that event that's happening there before you. Uh, a funeral. It's dreadful, but it's also fascinating. In fact, you're there because, for one reason, you're there, maybe to celebrate the life that's just completed, but you're there also because death itself is fascinating, because relating to death is a fascinating problem. Uh, so gathering to ritualize the passing of a member of your group or life is both dreadful and fascinating. And then the third part of awe or Wonder is courage. The courage to experience the intensity of dread. The courage to experience the intensity of fascination. So whenever life confronts you with dread and fascination, some kind of combination, it's confronting you with the courage to have that intensity and live it. And if all three of those things are there, you're in awe. Ancient sages of the Orient found paths beyond the, the yang of thought and the yin of feeling into the way of wonder. In Sabasia, Hindu and Buddhist seers found methods of concentrating, of concentration that opened enlightenment beyond binding thought, joy beyond relative feelings, reactive feelings, and liberation beyond failed compulsions. In the West, Great minds focused on great thoughts that carried consciousness beyond the customs of foolishness into experiences of great feels and great resolves that together with the great thoughts witnessed to a landscape of wonder. Wonder is another word for awe and the numinous. Wonder lights up thought with new vigor. 
Wonder cleans feelings of their exaggerated sentiment. Wonder interprets compulsive behaviors and restores us to the paths of freedom, effectiveness, and persistence. Wonder is a hard experience to talk about, but that has not prevented every era of humans from trying. These are another way of breaking down or organizing uh, these uh, states of all, uh, these states of spirit, or I like to call it profound humanness. This is, this is your profound level of being human. And uh, as you can see, the structure of this chart, uh, structures between intentionality on the one's left-hand side and intentionality on the right-hand side. This is your knowing side of the chart, those first those three states of being over there. And then there's the doing side of the chart uh, on, the, on, the, on the right, uh, the three on the right. The three in the middle are the being states of all. And then the chart, top and bottom, relates to solitariness. The three on the bottom are more related to your solitary existence. The states of being more related to your solitary existence. And the top three are more related to your life with others. Uh, the, the, the togetherness aspect of, of profound humanness. Uh, enchantment with being, uh, the love of reality, joyous stillness. Uh, enchantment is a very helpful word for this state of being. Uh, maybe you've been enchanted at various times in your life with various things, like you know the first lover that you really resonated with uh, was perhaps an enchanting experience. Uh, or perhaps you've found a community of people somewhere that was really enchanting, or a period in your life that was enchanting, uh, uh, or, or a work relationship that was, well, this is it, you know, th this is enchanting. So we have a lot of juice cen centered around the word enchanting uh, as some of those really great moments of, of our living. To be enchanted with being is to be enchanted with literally everything the ups and the downs of life. And enchanted is just such a powerful thing. That, that's, that's the most, to be enchanted with being is the most intense kind of enchantment. To be enchanted with being is enchantment beyond enchantment. Uh, that's a, the kind of thing, it's kind of a glow added to everything. It's, it's a kind of a brilliancy sort of added to everything. Uh, enchantment with being is intensification, but it's not, necessarily emotionally ecstatic. Uh, enchantment with being can be very quiet, more subtle, uh, joyous stillness. It can be rest. It can be just a glow to everything. Outflowing compassion. We've so sentimentalized the love of others that it takes a little harshness almost to get this one really understood. Uh, for example, loving our own children is a challenge. Let's, let's just admit, it's a challenge. I had four and my current wife had two, so we have six human beings to keep up with as children. Or they're no longer children, any of them, but we keep up with them anyway as adults in our life now, but still, we're related to them in a very special way. And when you have six people like that to relate to, not selected by you, <laughs> exactly, although you're responsible for them being here, but still, uh, they're a surprise. And out of six, one of them is going to fall far from the tree, as they say. <laughs> as they're just not going to fill any kind of expectation you could have possibly come up with. And they're not going to be a, uh, what, what you call it, a reproduction of you. <laughs> they're going to fall far from the trees. I have a person in my neighborhood that I, I kind of like. I mean, he, he talks to us when we walk around the block. He, he's with a member of our little block club that got the county commissioner to repair our road. But he is a Southern Baptist of the worst sort. 
And he gives me a sermon I can't quite accept on every walk I meet him with. <laughs> One of his most recent sermons was that uh, he thought the whole problem of the world was that women were no longer in the home. <laughs> that the last thing children should see as they leave in the morning was their mother at the door waving goodbye. And the first thing they should see when they come home is their mother waving hello. That that is the way, the, if the world were like that, all the problems would be solved. At the time, I didn't have the presence of mind to respond as I thought of later, but I wish now I had, though I don't know how I would have taken it if I just said, well, my solution is that we ought to have the men occupy the home because they're making such a mess of the world and, and let the women run it for a while. <laughs> but anyhow, you get the idea. The people on your block are, are not going to be easy to love. Uh, and my nation. Let's move to Sweden, okay? Humanity as a whole. Why we can't deal with the most obvious challenges of global warming and climate catastrophe and aristocratic nonsense and dictatorship and ungrueling poverty. We just can't get our stuff together to make decent responses to those things. So loving humanity is a demand. And that's what we're after here. To feel this state of being is just opening to this kind of demand. We got a little bit of a feel of that in the Mountain of Care a while ago. Opening this field, opening yourself to the demand of others in your life for a really creative responding. Cousin Zakas held this for me with this little sentence that uh, scared me to death and, and yet loved me to death for all my life after I heard it. He says, love responsibility. Say, it is my duty and mine alone to save the earth. If it is not saved, then I alone am to blame. That state of being really gets me, I'll tell you. Uh, I can't possibly do everything, but I need to live in that acceptance of the demand. I'm to blame. I am responsible for everything. Okay, that's outflowing compassion. Don't forget it. All right, <clears throat> down here on the lower right hand corner is primal merging. Beyond egoism, persistent initiative. Uh, beyond egoism means being beyond who you think you are. Uh, and uh, the personality patterns that you customarily live out of. Uh, for example, I showed up at age 16 or so as a very shy person. That may not seem obvious to you this morning, but I was a wallflower. Dating girls was like stepping off a cliff into the ocean. Uh, and getting off the side of the room and dancing with somebody was a huge challenge. And I was just a mathematician, you know, off here in the clouds of abstract thought and interesting ideas and a physicist. And you know, I was a nerd. <laughs> and being a, a shy person seemed like just automatic. I mean, what else could you be? If you're shy, you're shy, right? No, that is not who I am. That is not who you are if you're shy. Uh, this shy personality can be transcended to a degree that's astonishing. Or maybe you're an angry person as your personality type. You just are in a small rage about everything most of the time, a uh, raging bull in, in life's going on. <laughs> well, that's not who you are. Uh, you can transcend raging bull. Uh, you're more than that. Or maybe you're just uh, boisterous as your personality type. Uh, no, you can calm that down for whatever situation you need to. So anyway, what I'm talking about, primal merging is finding your place in your freedom to be more than the customary ego and personality that is habitually uh, discharacterizing your existence. So it's merging with that freedom. It's merging with that capacity to be more than you think you are. To some sense, accomplishing less than you think you can. But mostly, most of us are 
depreciating the greatness of being a human being. So mostly, uh, primal merging means merging with the greatness that you're neglecting and not letting loose in, in this world. Inherent purity, beyond good and evil, audacious boldness. Uh, I am an uncaused, unauthorized, unprecedented set of options and creative response to everything. Uh, the Adam and Eve myth is a great story about this state of being. The, the, the tree off of which Adam and Eve ate is called the knowledge of good and evil, right? It wasn't, the, wasn't knowledge they were not to eat, it was the knowledge of good and evil. That they were to know what was the right thing to do and what was the wrong thing to do and to be certain about what they were doing. That was the temptation. And it looked good to eat. It looks good to eat to us, actually, doesn't it? To know what the right thing to do is, absolutely. To know what the wrong thing to do is, absolutely. And to feel certain about everything you do. Pretty tasty. So <laughs> eating off that tree is the beginning of our problems, according to that story. Uh, uh, the devil said it was good to eat, but uh, God said this is forbidden, and it's still forbidden. Every decision you make is an ambiguous decision uh, in which you do not know what's the perfectly right thing to do or the perfectly wrong thing to do. You just know you're there with your august freedom. And strangely enough, inherent purity is being that freedom, accepting the fact that you can act without certainty, that you can just risk and risk again, and risk again a decision in the midst of totally confusing, ambiguous, challenging, unbelievable circumstances, and, and be, in that sense, pure to your deep freedom. That audacious boldness, uh, you know you don't know what to do, you do something. Uh, I give the illustration of my divorce of my first wife and marriage of the second. That was an incredibly difficult transition because the religious order I belonged to didn't approve of my divorce. Uh, and I had to take into view the fact that that was a big thing to me because these were the best friends in my whole life and the only vocation that mounted anything to me. But I was being confronted with a decision of leaving that great vocation in order to straighten out my marital relationships or leaving my marriage the way it was, which was not what I wanted for the rest of my life, in order to be a part of this order. And there was no right answer, or there was two right answers, or there's two wrong answers, I don't know what it was, but at any rate, you get, may get a little bit the feel of being confronted with, with those kinds of decisions in your life. And uh, living beyond good and evil, doing audaciously bold things, uh, is an access of your inherent purity, your authenticity, your profound humanness. The last one up there is a tin, a tune working. Rape is not a tune working. Love making might be a tune working. So you've got to get that as a symbol in your mind there. Being sure of acting out rigid dogma and pushing your liberal ideologies on life uh, is not a tune working. Contextual ethics is a good symbol for what a tune working means. It means letting in the real reality you're having to deal with and understanding as best you can and then making some decisions that are uh, attuned to the reality you're living with, uh, the people you're living with, the, the world situation you're living with. Uh, I love a piece of scripture that is put in the mouth of Jesus by the gospel writer of John. Uh, it goes like this. My father's working and I am working. This is you know, a symbol of the authentic person saying this. The, the final mystery is working here and I am working in attunement with the working of this final mystery. That's what I mean by attuned working. And it means being beyond fate. That is, people say that global warming cannot be solved. They're just going to give into it and sail to their doom as best they can. <laughs> no. 
It's living beyond fate. There is no final answer as to how things can, can outcome. Uh, I can be attuned to the possibilities in my situation in a way that the world around me is refusing to acknowledge. And it means obedient implementation. Uh, it's strange to talk about obedience as a part of freedom, but that's this kind of obedient implementation of attuned working in the situation you have on your hands is freedom. It's the creative end of freedom, uh, to create life and to create life in my times. 